You're listening to the Legal Talk Network. Hello, I'm Bob Ambrogi. And I'm Monica Bay. We've been writing about law and technology for more than 30 years. That's right. During that time, we've witnessed many changes and innovations. Technology is improving the practice of law, helping lawyers deliver their services faster and cheaper. Which benefits not only lawyers and their clients, but everyone. And moves us closer to the goal of access to justice for all. Tune in every month as we explore the new legal technology and the people behind the tech here on Law Technology Now. Hi, I'm Monica Bay, and welcome to Law Technology Now. I have a fantastic guest today, Charles Duhigg. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. We had the great opportunity. You were so kind. I believe it was 2014 where you came to Legal Tech uh, New York and did a fantastic, absolutely excellent speech. Uh, You had the keynote uh, there and everybody was absolutely raving. Uh, So I know you have a little experience in the legal community. One of the reasons I was very excited to have you come on our show is because of your new book, Smarter, Faster, Better. And I think there's a lot of relevance for the entire legal community and especially big law from your book. Every time when I came across one of your segments, I thought, wow, lawyers need to know this. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about that and One of the things that faces the legal community right now is across the board, 80% of Americans cannot either find a lawyer or can they afford a lawyer. And there's been a lot of critics who are saying we need more tech, we need to revise the way that legal works, we need to have it not be so heavily about billable hours, so forth and so on. James Sandman is a huge advocate for this. He's the president of the Legal Services Corp. So my first question for you is, from your point of view, is there anything that jumps out at you that you think is important for lawyers to know with your two books, Smarter, Faster, Better, and The Power of Habit? Well, um, so I'm actually from a family of lawyers. I, um, I've spent most of my life around lawyers and, and, and almost became a lawyer myself. And most days regret not having actually finished law school. Um, I, I just took a handful of classes. But, um, and so this is something I think about a lot. My, my sister, my brother, my mother, and my father are all trial lawyers in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I think the thing that strikes me is that whether you're a, a trial lawyer who's sort of, you know, whose economic drivers are contingency fees, or whether you're a lawyer for a big firm where you're thinking about, you know, you bill yourself hourly, or whether you're someone who does public service and pro bono work, a lawyer fundamentally is dealing, all lawyers are dealing in the same commodity, which is time right? At the end of the day, the reason why the law is so fascinating is because it's something we can't automate. It's something that that for the most complex questions, we need to have people making great decisions. We need to have lawyers who are trained in the law, making decisions and choices to help those of us who don't have law degrees figure out how to navigate through it. And I think that anyone whose profession is predicated upon making choices about how they spend their time has to think about how to become more productive. And the truth of the matter is that we all have the same problem, which is that there's only 24 hours in each day. Whether you're President Obama, or whether you're a Supreme Court justice, or whether you're a writer like me, we all only get 24 hours. And so the question becomes, and this is kind of what motivated writing Smarter, Faster, Better, was this question of why do some people seem to use those 24 hours better than others? Why do they seem to get so much more done? And What the research behind this indicates, because we're kind of living through this golden age of understanding the neurology of productivity and the organizational management of productivity, is that the most productive people tend to be the ones who paradoxically find routines or habits that allow them to think a little bit more than everyone else, right? And I I think probably everyone listening to this has had this experience that In today's economy, it is possible now to be busy every minute of every day. You can respond to every email. You can deal with every meeting that comes up. You can every request that comes in. But we all know that the people who are most productive are the ones who manage to take a step back and say, no, I need to prioritize. This is what's important. That isn't. I don't need to deal with all those emails. I can do this instead. 
giving yourself routines that allow you to think, that's what makes the difference between busyness and productivity. When I read both of the books, I was just so mesmerized by the application in so many different areas. And in both of the books, I really loved both of them. On the first book, I was particularly moved by the Alcoa story. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what Paul O'Neill, and it's not the Paul O'Neill sure. from the Yankees, it's another Paul O'Neill. Right, right, right. The other Paul O'Neill, <laughs> the one who was the Treasury Secretary. So before Paul O'Neill was Treasury Secretary under Bush, he was the CEO of Alcoa, which is one of the largest aluminum companies in the world. And what I love about this Alcoa story is that it sort of demonstrates this central idea, which is that when it comes to organizations, there is a huge amount of research to suggest that leaders, rather than focusing on trying to create widespread change, ought to try and focus on creating one kind of change. And that if you change the right organizational habits within a company or an organization, that it seems to set off a chain reaction sometimes that changes other patterns as well. And within the academic literature, these are known as keystone habits, these habits that seem to have a disproportionate power. So when Paul O'Neill comes into Alcoa, he's a guy who actually doesn't have much background, any background really in manufacturing. He had been the head of OMB um, under President Carter and President Johnson. He comes in and he had worked previously at a paper uh, manufacturing plant. And then he comes in as the CEO of one of the largest aluminum companies on earth. And when he steps into this role, everyone figures he's going to focus on increasing profitability or efficiency or, or you know, getting better quality products or customer service. But instead, in his first meeting with shareholders, he says, the thing I want you to judge me on is whether I can improve our worker safety habits. I want you to judge this company based on whether we stop injuries from happening at all. Now, anyone who's been in an aluminum factory knows it's this incredibly dangerous place, right? It was not unusual for Alcoa, which had hundreds of thousands of employees, to have as many as one critical injury or death per month in the company. And Paul O'Neill comes in and he says, look, I got to change this company. And I, I, there's a dozen things I want to change. But if I go to the workers and I say, I want you to become more profitable, they're going to tell me to go stuff it. And if I go and I say to the managers, I want to focus on customer satisfaction, they're going to tell me, look, my job is to run a factory, not to worry about that. But employee safety, employee safety is basically something everyone agrees on. Because guys on the factory floor, they don't want to they don't want to feel like they're in danger. And managers, managers actually have, want to take care of their people, right? Nobody can disagree with employee safety. And he says, look, here's how I think we should change employee safety. I want us to create the best quality workforce, a place where no one ever gets injured. And the only way we can do that is by studying how to make our process more efficient, how to do everything right, how to never have an accident or a mistake. Because accidents or mistakes, that's where people get hurt. Now, the brilliance of this is that by saying, I want to focus on worker safety, what he's really saying is these factories need to become more efficient. They need to become better. They need to become cleaner. They need to become more predictable. By focusing on worker safety, Paul O'Neill actually starts looking at these other things that he wants to change, but he does it in the language of worker safety, in the habits of worker safety, in something everyone can buy into. And in doing so, not only does he make Alcoa into the safest company on earth, not just the safest aluminum company, the safest company. You had a better, higher odds of injuring yourself as an accountant than you did making aluminum at Alcoa. He also makes it one of the best performers in the Dow Jones Industrial Average because we all know that at the end of the day, in order to have a safe workplace, you usually have a really well-functioning workplace. In your new book, which is, again, Smarter, Faster, Better, you have really a fascinating section about plane crashes and, and a plane that did not crash, uh, Air France 447 and Qantas 32. Tell us the lessons that the legal profession can learn from those two airplanes. Well, it's interesting because so Air France Flight 447, most people probably remember, is the flight that crashes into the Atlantic Ocean. And what's interesting about that flight is that there was nothing wrong with the plane. It's a situation where the pilots created an emergency almost entirely. And then we can contrast that with another incident, Qantas Flight 32, which you mentioned, which is one that most Americans aren't familiar with, but is really well known in Australia because it was an Australian airline, where this airplane actually had the worst mid-air mechanical disaster in history. Basically, a fan blade inside one of the engines shot off of the main cylinder and like 
poked a huge hole in the wing of the plane. And the pilots in that case were able to land the plane without one injury. And so the question then becomes, why these different outcomes, right? What explains why some people make mistakes and other people don't? And what researchers have found is that a lot of that has to do with how actively they create for themselves what are known as mental models. Or put differently, with how much degree of specificity do they tell themselves a story about their life as their life is occurring? How much do they visualize what they expect to have occur? Now, a lot of what we know about building mental models comes from things like studies of um, firefighters. One of the things we know is that the best firefighters, expert firefighters, when they walk into a room where there's a fire, they immediately start telling themselves a story about what they expect to see. They say, okay, in the left corner, I think I'm going to see flames. And in the right corner, there's a staircase. And I expect to see that burning even faster because stairs burn faster than anything else. And then when they walk into that room and they don't see as many flames on the staircase as they expected, some part of their brain immediately says, focus on the staircase. There's something wrong with the staircase. Try and figure out what's going on. Or in studies of um, executives, there's a big studies that have been done of Fortune 500 executives, and what they found is that the most successful executives tend to visualize their day with just a little bit more specificity than everyone else. So instead of saying, like, I have a meeting at 10 o'clock, and then I have to meet a client at 11 o'clock, they say, okay, I've got a meeting at 10 o'clock, and it's going to start with Jim bringing up that dumb idea he always brings in, and then Susie's going to disagree with Jim because Susie hates Jim, and then I'm going to jump in with my idea, and I'm going to look like a genius, right? It's just like an extra 20 seconds of visualizing how this meeting is going to unfold, but we all know how powerful that is, that if you sort of have a plan in mind, if you have a mental model, a story you've told yourself of how you expect things to unfold, not only does it make you more prepared for that meeting, it also makes you much better prepared when the unexpected happens, when your boss asks a question out of nowhere, or when, when someone says something you didn't expect, you're able to kind of roll with it, to anticipate and react to that surprise. And that's what the difference was between Air France Flight 447 and Qantas Flight 32. In Air France Flight 447, the one that crashed into the ocean, you basically had some pilots who had no mental model whatsoever. They were pilots who had become trained to react almost unthinkingly to all of the autopilots and technology around them. So when an alarm went off, they responded to that alarm rather than taking a step back and thinking, does this alarm make sense? Like, is something happening here that actually I need to, to panic about? Or, or is it possible that there's a mechanical malfunction in the alarm system? Whereas on Qantas Flight 32, where they were able to land this plane without any injuries, when all of a sudden the alarms did go off, the pilot, the main pilot, the captain, who's sitting in the cockpit, he's looking at all these alarms, and what he decides to do is close his eyes for a moment and say, look, I can become overwhelmed by all the panic around me. I can stop thinking and just purely become reactive, but that's going to crash this plane. What I need to do is I need to take control and to do that, I'm going to pretend that this plane is a Cessna, one of the simplest planes on Earth, because imagining it as a Cessna, if nothing else, it helps me figure out what to pay attention to and what to ignore. And that's how he landed the plane. And for lawyers, the same thing is true, right? You walk into an office and your pocket starts buzzing first thing. You've got 100 emails waiting for you. There's 10 meetings that people are asking you to come sit in on. You could spend your entire day simply reacting. But if you're someone who sat down and said, okay, Here's how I think the day is going to proceed between 9 and 11 o'clock. And here's my top goal. Here's what I really want to get done. When I go into this client meeting, I know that he's going to be, the client's going to be worried about you know, what this is doing to his business. And I need to convince him to stop thinking about his business and instead start thinking about the litigation that we're dealing with. And it seemed to me also in that section, I was very moved on the Qantas uh, one about how they talked together as a team before they even sat down in their chairs. Well, that's exactly right. And this is what we know. You know, I mentioned before that, that people who are most productive, they have these contemplative routines, these routines that help them think. One of the most powerful routines is essentially just talking to other people in a way that gets them to question you and allows you to question them. So the captain of Qantas Flight 32, one of the things he would do is, as you mentioned before they got onto the plane, he would make all of his co-pilots tell him stories about what they were going to do in case of an emergency. You know, where are the first place that your eyes are going to go if, if engine two goes out? If we have a, a loss of altitude, tell me the first words that are going to come out of your mouth. And then after they would tell him the story about what they're going to do, he would essentially argue with them. He would kind of push back and say, 
well, you know, why is that the first thing you're going to say? Why don't you say this other thing? Or, or are you sure you want to put your eyes there? Don't you want to put your eyes over here? And it's this act of talking to each other, of questioning each other, of having these conversations that are kind of like, you know, intellectual sparring matches. That's how we learn to become nimble and agile. That's how we learn to pivot when we need to, if our mental model isn't working. And the great thing about being a lawyer is that this is like second nature, right? To, 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 <laughs> to, uh, to argue the point and think of alternatives, this is the basis of how the law works. And it turns out that that act of arguing, that act of having an intellectual partner, that is what makes us smarter. That is a contemplative routine that we can build into our life that helps us become more mentally nimble. I want to switch, speaking of pivoting here, but... Switching, but also kind of being on the same theme here. In your section where you talk about the kidnapping and how the FBI ended up with a one person completely changing all of the tech, and those of us who've been in law forever know that technology and fast are very rarely in the same sentence for anybody who is doing work at a big law, in particular law firm. Tell us that story, if you would. Well, so one of the interesting things about the FBI is that they, they have essentially changed to a completely agile methodology, not only in how they develop their technology, but also in how they run the agency and how they empower investigators to do their work. So I think everyone listening, if, if you're in technology, you know that there's been this huge shift from in how we plan technology to adopt a, a lean model or an agile methodology, right? Where instead of saying, we're going we're gonna to make all the decisions ahead of time, we're going to plan exactly how this thing's going to go, to saying, we're going to start down a path and we're going to ask the people who are closest to the problem to help us solve that particular problem. And a lot of this actually, interestingly, started with auto manufacturing, particularly a, a Toyota plant in California named the Numi plant and what was then known as lean manufacturing, which is the precursor to agile methodologies. And what they basically said, it was this insight that, that you can't figure out all the problems you're going to experience ahead of time. So what you need to do is you need to empower people to solve problems when they come across them. And that oftentimes the first person to come across a problem, whether that's a programmer or someone working on a factory floor or a junior attorney, that person actually can oftentimes solve that problem better than anyone else because they're the closest person to it. So what does this mean for those of us who are, who are working in technology or who want to learn from examples like the FBI and their ability to sort of revolutionize how they integrate tech into their work? Well, what it tells us is that one of the best things that we can do is that we can try and empower the people around us to make great choices. That oftentimes, if you're a, a junior FBI agent and you're chasing down a lead, it used to be that you were in a hierarchy and you had to ask for permission before pursuing a clue. And what the FBI has said is, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. If you're chasing a lead, you should be able to determine which clues matter and which don't. You should develop your instincts because your instincts are going to be better than some guy sitting in an office. Similarly, if you're working on a big lawsuit and I have friends who are in this situation and you've got 100 lawyers working on it, or if you're trying to change the technology inside a law firm, it's really tempting for the person at the top of the organizational chart to say, look, every decision has to be run by me. This is too important. I got to weigh in on everything. But what we know about the most agile companies is that they tend to do the opposite. They tend to say, when you have a problem you can't solve, then you come to me and ask my advice. But I'm going to empower you, junior attorney or junior technologist, to at least take a first stab at solving that problem. Because by virtue of the fact that you're closer to it, you probably see some innovations that would never occur to me. Well, I know we're running out of time, but I want to ask you one more quick question really quickly. You preach in the first book, and it, I think the theme goes through into the second, on always take advantage of a crisis. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think this is just, this is just good sense, right, for folks who have been through crises before. One of the things that we know is that in the midst of a crisis, everything becomes more flexible, Right in the midst of a corporate crisis, suddenly people are willing to, to reconsider how they've been doing things for years. When individuals have crises, we know that those are times when their own personal habits are more likely to change. Most people, ha when they, they go through a health crisis or, or they're getting a divorce or something like that, that's when they actually change their lives much more than at other moments. And so 
the problem with a crisis is that it's super unpleasant, right? Like nobody wants to have a crisis just to make a change. So the question becomes, how can we learn from this without having to, to have everything go to hell? And the answer is that you can create the perception of a crisis. You can create the conditions of a crisis without actually having to experience one and make folks flexible. You know, when you hear Tim Cook at Apple talk to his troops, he never talks to the company about how great they are. He always says, you know, we're doing well right now, but tomorrow, tomorrow there could be some new startup that would put us out of business in three years. He creates the perception of a crisis when it, one doesn't even exist because he knows in doing so, he's helping his people become flexible. People do the same things, right? You sit down and you say, oh gosh, I've been eating really unhealthily for the last decade. And you know, I haven't had any heart attacks, nothing, but you know, I have, a, I have a doctor's appointment coming up in a month, and I just know that like that doctor is going to tell me that my health is not great unless I start eating vegetables and exercising right now. Now, nobody knows that, right? There's no doctor who tells you that you're out of the blue, that your health isn't, isn't good and you've got a problem. But by creating this perception that change is important and needed, we make it easier to accomplish. And that's the important lesson is that never let a crisis go to waste. Never, never miss that opportunity. But more importantly, think about how you message things to yourself and to your employees. Because if you can create the perception of a potential crisis, then you help people get down the path of change. Charles, thank you so much for your time. And once again, the books are The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business, and Smarter, Faster, Better, The Secrets of Being Productive in Life and Business. Charles, can you tell us a little bit about how to contact you? They can get the book at Amazon or any bookstore, Barnes & Noble that they live near, any of their preferred booksellers or audible.com if they want to listen to it. And um, I'm Charles at charlesduhig.com. I'd love to hear from folks. Terrific. Well, thank you so much. I, I wish I had five hours to go on this. And, and uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm looking forward to the Do we know what the next book will be? Uh, I, I don't yet. If you do, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. like more information about what you've heard today, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Subscribe via iTunes and RSS. Find us on Twitter and Facebook. Or download our free Legal Talk Network app in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.